Okay, true or false? <clears throat> Church is a building. False. <laughs> Church is a building. True or false? False. <clears throat> Good. So the original word is a Greek word, obviously. The, use, the, the term church isn't really used until the New Testament, which is all written in Greek. And what it is, is it's ecclesia in Greek, and it's actually referred to assembly of citizens. It's, it's about gathering of people that we're talking about. So when we talk about church, we're not talking about a fancy church building. That didn't happen until centuries after Jesus died. Right? So when we talk about church, it's when they gathered, when they gathered together in homes, in public places, in various places to worship Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what we might mean by church. So how do we know? How do we know that it is or talking about a building? <clears throat> so we go to Romans 16:5. Greet also the church in their houses. Huh? Can you imagine like a church building inside the houses of people? So greet also the church in their houses is what Romans 16.5 is saying. So what is it talking about here? Their houses is a reference to where the people have gathered to praise and worship God. Right? Indicates that early Christians, and, and this is exactly what it was like in the early Christianity, people gathered in their houses to praise God. There were no church buildings and it was a combination of factors such as persecution. So they, they needed to hide. They could have put up a big church building with a cross sign on top because they would get persecuted. What did the Romans do? We talked about this before. They, they set out, right? They set out to kill all the Christians in Rome, the early Christians. And they burned them up and lit them up in the streets and used them as torches. They crucified them. They hung them upside down on the cross. So that's what happened in, the, in Romans, in early Christianity. So what we are talking about is the church being an assembly of gatherers, right? Who believe in Jesus Christ our Lord, who gather and worship and pray together. And that's what we mean by um, church. So the church, as I said, it's a spiritual community of believers. With, and we are body. Right? And what does, what does it say in the, in the book of Ephesians? It says it is described as the body of Christ, with Jesus Christ himself being the head. And it's Ephesians 1, 22 to 23. And he put all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and gave Jesus, gave him as head over all things to the church, to the assembly of believers, to the body of church, which is us, the Christians. The fullness of him who fills all in all, and what does that mean by that? Who, Jesus, who fills every aspect of creation. So that's what we mean by church. So we've got the definition clear now. I want to just go on talking a little bit about the birth of church. When do you think body of believers truly came to be? We go back to Acts. You know, you know I love the book of Acts these days, right? <clears throat> Acts 2... One to four. So we turn our attention to the book of Acts. We counter, I think, a pivotal moment in the history of church. And it is the day of Pentecost. Remember that? Day of Pentecost? It was, what, 50 days after Jesus resurrected. And so, what happened? When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues of as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Remember this? They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is significant. And, and, and I, I meditate on, me, meditated on the following text. Because why is this so significant? Because this is what God promised. This is what Jesus promised before he left. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, what happens? 
What does that actually mean? Being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a new era, isn't it? No longer are we bound by the constraints of a physical temple. So if you remember the Old Testament, tabernacles, the holy earthly places, the temple. What are some of the temple built by Solomon? What are some of the common things? They believe that the dwelling place of God was within the holy earthly places. Right? So what happened after we got filled with the Holy Spirit? Let, let us meditate on this because I think this is a beautiful text. Ephesians 2.22 In Him you also being built together what? Into a you are, you, me, you are being built together. You're being built up. What? Into a dwelling place for God. Your body is being built as a dwelling. Your God dwells in you. Built up for a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Like, when you read, I, I don't know about you, but when I read this again, I got goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps right now. Like your body is a dwelling place of God. And it is confirmed again in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, which says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is so precious. And, and there I was like, okay, well, my body is meant to be a dwelling place for God. So what should I do with my body? Now, if I was to invite, let's say you've got a physical house, obviously. Let's say I was invite, I was invite my wife. Oh, before I got married, I invited my wife. It was probably still very, very messy. But before I invited my wife to my room for the first time, and when I was living with my parents, I cleaned it up. <laughs> I cleaned it up massively, right? You, you clean up your house before before the real estate agent comes for an inspection. Right? You, you clean up your house before you invite someone important. So when we, when we had pastor over, our, our, our head pastor over at our place once, you know, we cleaned it up, right? That's what you do. <laughs> but you, you are a body being built up as a dwelling place for God. Should you not more so clean it up? We talked about the, the, the Holy Spirit last week, right? What were the desires of the flesh? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, dissension, fits of anger, idolatry, and so on, right? Orgies and things like that. But what were the fruits of the Holy Spirit? So we need to get rid of them. It is a dwelling place for God. Do you understand that? Like, I can't believe it. How can my body be a dwelling place of God? Let's get rid of them all. Clean it all up. And what? Fill it with goodness. Fill it with goodness. And to get to how we can do that, I go to, I take you to Acts, the book of Acts. You know, I love the book of Acts. But on the topic of churches, on the topic of a body of believers, I don't think there is anything that exemplifies better than the book of Acts. Because book of Acts is when it all started, right? So Jesus ascended to heaven and there were first body of believers and in the book of Acts. So what, hap <laughs> what happened in the book of Acts? Church in the book of Acts. Okay. So one keyword, one keyword that I could find is the word devotion. Devotion. And I think that's the keyword of the day. Devotion. All right. <clears throat> so book of Acts 2.42. And they, they devoted themselves to the apostles. So read this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is what they were fully devoted to, the early church, the early body of Christ. And so these are the things that we're going to talk about today. What do they mean? What do we mean? What do we mean? So I, I want us to all devote ourselves to these things. Clean it up. 
Make it ready for as a dwelling place for God. <clears throat> so, first, first, is apostles' teaching. Apostles' teaching. You know, it, it was in the book of days where they did not have a physical Bible in their hands. Right? They didn't. The manuscripts didn't come. Well, I mean, we, first, we probably didn't even have, we didn't have the Gospels written by, uh, back then. Right? So it was all just word of mouth. Apostles teaching one another. Right? Can you imagine, can you imagine how much they would have appreciated being able to hold a Bible in their hand? It's just like the North Koreans, right? They, it's so hard to get a copy of the Bible. You cannot get a Bible. But what do we have? We all have Bible in our hands. We all have Bible in our phones. How blessed are we? I just want you to remember that. First thing mentioned, which I think is normally when we, when we read the Bible, the first things that are mentioned is probably the most important thing. So I believe this is one of the most important things. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And I think the message here is the knowledge of God is so important. The knowledge of God is so important. And I go to Colossians 2, 2 to 3. It says that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of fullness of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's quite difficult to digest, right? What does that even mean? But, but I think one first thing is two places where knowledge is mentioned. What this text, I think, does, there are two things, two main things that this text does. It tells you what the knowledge is. <clears throat> tells you what <laughs> knowledge is. What is knowledge? Okay. Knowledge of God, mystery. Knowledge, knowledge, which is Christ. Christ himself is knowledge. Knowing Christ is knowledge that is the most important knowledge to get that and then what i think we find it's like it's like with, with this one with this text here it's almost like finding treasures what does it say the knowledge is what the full assurance of understanding the full assurance of understanding it provides you with an assurance. The knowledge of Christ is linked with providing you with an assurance. Assurance for salvation, assurance for life, assurance for light, assurance for the way, the truth. Right? That's the first. And then what? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ are hidden all these things. In Christ is where you find assurance. In Christ is where you find treasure. In Christ is where you find wisdom. That is the first thing. <clears throat> and second, second thing about knowledge. I think it is so important. How many times have you come, have, do, have you come, through, come to a difficult circumstance and remember the Bible verse and it's been an immense strength to you? Every time, every time these days for me, when someone persecutes me just randomly, and sometimes I actually, one day out in the city, there were like these drunk kids, like big kids. I'm talking about really big kids. And they do silly things, right? They come in front of you and like they, you know, they try and knock you a little bit. There are, there are lots of, lots of, lots of times where we, we come across people that are difficult in our lives. But the Bible verse, it is the knowledge of God, it is knowledge of the Bible that helps me. Never avenge yourselves, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And it says, To the contrary, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Right? That Bible verse 
it helps me immensely. But it's not just in those circumstances that, it, that the Bible helps you. There are Bible verses that pop in your mind every single time something comes up, right? And it helps you. And that's what this is trying to say, 2 Peter 3.18. So just before this, just before this verse, it says, basically, don't be carried away with the error and the lawless people and lose your stability. So in other words, it's trying to say, how do you stay stable in your lives? It's saying, but grow in the grace and what? Knowledge. Knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So how do you stay stable? Knowledge. Knowledge. Grace and knowledge. Grace and knowledge. <clears throat> and so, I, that, that was the first point. As a body of Christ, we should dedicate ourselves, as the early Christians did, to the Word of God. To the Word of God. And it should be so good. We've, ta we've tasted that it is good. We should keep reading the words. And that's what the biggest emphasis was for the early Christians. The words, the knowledge. Okay, second. <clears throat> second was fellowship. Fellowship. Deep sense of fellowship. Not just light, deep sense of fellowship. So they basically embraced one another. As members of the uh, mem as the members shared like family united by common bond in pri uh, Christ, they were bonded in Christ. They had real fellowship with one another, and where do you see that? It's it's the radical generosity that we see in Acts two forty four to forty five. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need as any had need it might come as a shocking shock to you i think the stats might be a little bit off right but apparently if you are if you have air conditioning and if you have roof over your head you're apparently in the top 10 percent so basically in everyone in australia is rich almost everyone in australia you could probably consider as being rich so you, we, we with air-conditioned rooms like this, we are in the top 10% of the world. So what do we do as, fellow, as Christians that now has access, thank God for this, right? We have access to various means of providing for our fellow believers elsewhere that are in need. And this is not merely a philanthropy. It's not just making donations for donations' sake, right? Because some people, non-Christians, still donate a lot. We've got various, what, like these donation, uh, these non-profit organizations set up by billionaires that, that feel some type of emptiness in their hearts because they've made all this money and they find out that they're not really that happy. What is this? This is way beyond it, right? It's, it's really, for me, when I read this, no one forced them to do it. It's not for their own sake. What is it? This is, I think, an outpouring of love. This is like, Christ loves me so much. He saved me. He chose me. He predestined me when I don't deserve any of this. I've been saved by grace through faith and it is not by works that I've been saved. And you go, wow, that is amazing and enjoy. And enjoy. You go out and sell everything you have. And they give it, hand it out to help them out. So this, this is a fellowship that I want all of us to aim for. <clears throat> We have so much. We have so much in abundance. So third, third point. <clears throat> Breaking of bread. So, 
in, in partaking. So, so basically you said they devoted, you saw that they devoted themselves to breaking of bread. What does that, what does that mainly mean? Breaking of bread. Well, it's to remember Christ. It's to meditate on Christ. It's to think about Christ and what He has done for us on the cross. Right? And so we come to 1 Corinthians 11, 24, 25. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, so this is Jesus saying it, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember me when you're doing this. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So what, what, is, it, what is it trying to say? They devoted themselves to what? To remember Jesus Christ. To meditate on him. And by doing that, you will build up all these feelings of gratitude, right? And so, bread <clears throat> here. When we when we when we remember when we when we break bread and eat it, what we are really trying to do is we're trying to remember the sacrifice on the cross. His his flesh got torn apart. His sacrifice on the cross, and also what by eating it. You're eating what? The bread of life. You're remembering that Jesus is the bread of life. Right? And when we, when we talk about the new covenant of the blood, what are we talking about? <clears throat> Remember we did a whole session on the blood of Jesus Christ? What did that really symbolize? The forgiveness of sins. The imputed righteousness. Righteousness that we did not deserve, but He imputed on us. And what? He has washed us white. Remember that? From the book of Revelations? He has washed us white. So what, what do we remember? We remember His sacrificial death. Remember the bread of life. We remember the new covenant. By grace we've been saved. Forgiveness, righteousness imputed to us. And He dwells within us now. That's what we remember. And lastly, and they, Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to prayer. What, what I think it really means is, as I said, it was a really difficult time for the Christians back then. I think they really, what, what, what it really means is, it formed a core part of their life. They did not rely on human wisdom and understanding, but they relied on everything. They sought guidance, they sought provision, they sought presence of God in all things, in all things, recognizing that they were utterly dependent on Christ. And Acts 1.14, this is after Jesus ascended. Acts 1.14 they were devoting themselves to prayer together with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So basically, these early Christians, as soon as Jesus ascended, they went into prayer. That's how important prayers are. And it's 4.31. And we, we went through this, the passage that precedes this last week. But this is when Peter, remember last week we talked about how Peter, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, he boldly proclaimed the message of Jesus Christ to the high priest and the high priest family. And this is after that. And when they had prayed, so they were persecuted. So when they boldly proclaimed that message about Jesus Christ, they were being persecuted, they were being accused of being false. And then what did they do? And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So, prayer. Prayer led to what? Holy Spirit. You, you being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So even in persecutions, you, we go to prayer. Acts 12, 5. <clears throat> now, I think this is a stunning text. Because the text that precedes this is about Herod, who killed James, the brother of John, right, with a sword. You, you're talking about a disciple that spent a lot of time with you being killed here, right? Your fellow disciple, James, the brother of John, got killed. And then they arrested Peter and also put Peter in prison. So Peter was in prison after having one of his best mates killed by Herod. And what did he do? Acts 12, 5. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So how many, per how many, how many, how many Christians do we have in the world that are being persecuted right now? There are, there are in the Middle Eastern countries. that are in Muslim countries. they are in North Korea. they are in China that are being persecuted. I think um, one of the missionaries came over the other week. I didn't listen to the, the, the full sermon. But in Malaysia, for example, these Christians, the missionaries are actually being secretly dragged by the religious police, religious police force, and they've been killed. They're disappearing. What should we do as a church? If we can't go to the missionaries ourselves, mission field ourselves, we should go pray earnestly. Let's pray earnestly for them. So the core message. The core message is what? The key word was devotion. Key word was devotion. What do we devote ourselves to? The words. Apostles' teachings. Right? Because apostles' teachings are written here, right here, in the New Testament. Right? Second was fellowship. Fellowship. Outpouring of love that comes from Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, what, what, what was our name? Follow, right? For the love of Lord overflows. So the outpouring of love results in fellowship and helping one another. And being selfless. Third, breaking of bread. <clears throat> when we do our communion, we do it in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord. When we eat, we do it for the glory of God. When we drink water, we do it for the glory of God. And then lastly, it was prayer. We, we not only pray for ourselves that we may be built up as a body of Christ, but we pray for others who are being persecuted right now. We pray earnestly for them. And then, <clears throat> mission of the church. So the, so the mission, the main mission, and you know, you know I love talking about the main mission for the body of Christ. This is a pivotal moment when Jesus commissions his disciples. And by extension, by, by extension, he's also talking about the church, the body of Christ, to carry out the mission of spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. That was, his, that was the great commission written in Matthew, right? In the last, last chapter of Matthew, last verse of Matthew. So Acts 1a, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So that is the mission given to us, to the church. So once we are devoted, once we, once we learn our words, once we build up knowledge of Jesus Christ, who He really is, what do we do? Once we pray, what do we do? What is our main mission? What is it to the end of? To what end are we doing all those things? To preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We should, we should really do something. Maybe we should talk, off, talk after this. <clears throat> and I love this. I, 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 this, was, this was really moving. This is the last text that I'll share with you today. This was really moving for me because... <clears throat> 
Let me read it. Let me read this first. Acts 8, 1, 4. And Saul approved of his execution. So Stephen is preaching. Stephen is preaching in front of the high priest. And then what happens to him? All the Jewish people, he is stoned to death. He is stoned to death. And Saul, who ends up writing almost half of the New Testament, approves who later becomes Paul, approves of his execution, Stephen's execution. And those who rose on that day, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Can you imagine the persecution to the church, to the body of believers in Jesus Christ, uh, of Jesus Christ? And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. So you can imagine Stephen, this figure who was good in speech. That's why they selected him, right? They had, he had the knowledge and wisdom and the speech and they selected him to represent the Christians and then he is stoned to death. And not only that, these Christians are all over the world, all over Jer Jerusalem is being persecuted. Just picture that, picture that. And then, great lamentation. They're crying over the death of Stephen. They're absolutely devastated over the death of Stephen. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So here's Apostle Paul, Saul who later becomes Apostle Paul, dragging these people and putting them into prison. Imagine, imagine Lucy going to prison. Imagine Joe getting dragged off to prison for proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the sorrow and the devastation that will come upon us? Can you imagine? But what happens? I think this is really, really surprising. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So, the persecution, the devastation, the lamentation did not break them down. But what did it do? It scattered them. It scattered them to different parts so that the gospel may be preached to the end of the earth. So that they may continue carrying out the mission given by our Lord Jesus Christ. So I think we, what I'm trying to say here is if they've used the persecution <laughs> as the means to scatter as, as to scatter and preach the word of Jesus Christ, what excuse do we have? We're, we're not even going to get persecuted preaching the gospel in, in, in Sydney, are we? Or we might get a little bit persecuted, but no one's going to put us to death, I don't think. So we should, absolutely. And this is the core message that I always come back to for, for all of us because I think it applies more to me than anyone else in this room. <clears throat> but I really just want to go and preach the word. It is, it is, I don't think the Lord will be satisfied just seeing us read the Bible alone and not speaking of Jesus Christ to anyone else in the world. The Lord wants us. He commanded us to go and preach the word of Jesus Christ. So, what are the main messages? Let's summarize. Devotion. Key word was devotion. Devotion in what? Teaching. The building of knowledge of God. Second was fellowship. Embracing one another. Loving one another. Outpouring of love. Breaking of bread in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Just continually meditating and remembering Jesus Christ our Lord throughout the day. Pray continually is what the Bible says. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. 
And then <clears throat> going to our Lord in prayer. Right? And when we've done all that, when we've done all that, we remember this picture and what the early Christians, our forefathers did. And we do the same for the next generation of people. Because we have to. In the land that is drying up with the gospel, where there is no gospel, and no one can even quote a verse in the Bible, we should absolutely go out there and do it for the sake of the next generation that will come after us. And, and your generation. Absolutely your generation. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. <clears throat>